have to tell you, I have to confess, I'm pretty jealous of Peter and what happened here. He returns from his travels. He's been visiting communities of believers. He's been encouraging them and performing healing miracles. He even raised Tabitha from the dead. But as he heads back to Jerusalem, what story reaches there before he does? The story of his visit to Gentiles. And so he faces not praise, not praise at having saved their souls or converted their hearts, but he faces criticism. How could you? How could you go in there and talk to them and even eat with them? But Peter doesn't let this criticism get to him. And here's where I'm jealous. He shares about his experience and his thoughts about the issue. One time, one time he gives his explanation and boom, everyone's hearts and minds are changed. Just like that. How does that work for you? I don't know, not for me at all. Um, instead, you know, these believers who had been anxious about contamination by Gentiles, fearful maybe about opening themselves up to persecution or arrest, which was a thing going on, right away, with one explanation, they are excited to welcome Gentiles into the fold. Peter didn't even need a full sermon. He didn't even need to make a reference to scripture. He just told about his vision and his experience and his thought, who am I to stand in the way of God? His belief that God was indeed creating all things in a new way. Wow. And so it was easy for me to make the connection of the two readings, the gospel reading, Jesus' commandment to love one another, and this, and this ready transformation of heart. Right? Jesus, before the night before he dies, tells the apostles to love one another. He's preparing them for his departure. He explains that he will only be with them for a little while longer, at least in physical form. As Deb pointed out, this commandment comes after a very troubling time. Just before this, Jesus' heart had been troubled. His spirit had been troubled because he knew someone was going to betray him. He says, someone's going to betray me. He hands the piece of bread to Judas and says, go, hurry, go quickly and do what you're going to do. And then all of a sudden, he is transformed. Again, this rapid transformation, not just acceptance, but a sense of purpose being filled. He called it not a sacrifice or a death or suffering, but he referred to it as glory. It is time for my glory. He talks about glory given to God and glory received from God. Everything, he's saying, was as it had to be for the glory of God. But nonetheless, he would be leaving them. And they needed to carry on without him. And the way to do that, he says, the way to carry on without me is to love each other. He called it a new commandment, a way of showing the world who they were, that they were followers of the way of Jesus. Love one another. It was the only way that they can do that, can show the world who they are and whose they are. It would be the only proof. He was not going to leave them with a physical marking. I think about the story of Abraham when God commanded Abraham to circumcise all the men to leave a physical mark showing that they were followers of God. I think about religious tradition over time began to dictate like learning scripture was important to show you were a follower of God, that you were in relationship to God, know the laws, know the scripture, know the theology. Jesus doesn't insist on celibacy or asceticism or wearing certain things. You don't have to show it that way. You don't have to prove any kind of purity. Just love one another. Love in the way that I have shown you. The litmus test, that was it. And I wonder, Deb talked about how Jesus might have been feeling, but I wonder how they were feeling. Did they have any idea how quickly his departure would come. He was trying to prepare them, but did he say, no, tonight, tonight, 
or, you know, in 50 days after the ascension. How quickly they had to learn to love one another as he had loved them, without him right there, loving them and giving them a model for love. Right away, the opportunity presented itself to practice Christ-like love. After he was arrested and they all ran away and they gathered together in that upper room, there they were full of grief and fear. Were they able to love one another? Were they able to be kind and patient and forgiving of themselves and of each other that very night? After the resurrection, he appeared to them in that upper room, except for Thomas. How did the apostles treat Thomas when he returned skeptical about their story? His insistence that he would not believe them until he saw for himself. Were they patient? Were they loving? Were they encouraging? I'm sure the visits with Jesus helped. Helped them go, okay, we can learn again how to love one another. <coughs> Jesus appeared to them first in the upper room and then, and then along the along the beach. I don't know if you know that story where he's telling them, feed my sheep. Um, and when they got to the beach, it was because Peter had said, I want to go fishing. And six others said, we'll go with you. And I love that, that sense of community, supporting Peter and what he wanted to do, wanting to be together, wanting to be with him. That bond of love was growing. Now, according to the book of Acts, who was not the same writer as the Gospel of John, so the story about loving one another, the new commandment is in the book of John, the Gospel of John. The person who wrote Luke also wrote the book of Acts. And according to this writer, the disciples did build this bond of love pretty quickly. They pulled it together pretty quickly after the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. There was this large group gathered on the day that we recognize as the birth of the church, the Pentecost. Over 120 people, I think, they said were there. When the tongues of flame rested over each head and the cacophony of languages gelled into something that was understandable and communicable to everyone. And after this anointing, these disciples, this large group and growing group of people organized themselves. They set about the work of bringing the good news to people everywhere. When they were together, the book of Acts tells us, when they were together, they held all things in common. As followers joined them, they would sell their possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone, anyone who had need. The book of Acts tells us in chapter 4 that this gathering of followers, they were of one heart and of one mind and one soul, and that no one claimed private ownership of anything. They worked out peacefully who would travel where to bring the word of God. They worked out who would do different types of ministry. Maybe we're not all called to evangelism. We need people to stay and tend to and do service ministries. And they anointed people for that. They baptized thousands and thousands in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They continued to perform healing miracles. And again, even raising people from the dead. They helped each other follow in the way of love, the way of Jesus, even in scary and perilous situations, as different ones of them were arrested or imprisoned or beaten and persecuted, even put to death. They still continued to encourage each other in love. So yeah, no wonder Peter had an easy time convincing the believers in Jerusalem. This bond of love has been growing as they keep loving each other. As Christ loved them. It sounds perfect, doesn't it? Just like Jesus commanded. And yet we all know that our memories aren't perfect. We like to put a shine, a rosy glow, as we look back on how things were. So we can imagine the writer of Acts thinking about all the stories he heard of the early days of the church and how wonderful it was and he wished he could have been there and I bet everyone held everything in common and I bet they agreed on everything very easily. Imagine that you're writing for future generations, right, to inspire the faith of others. Wouldn't you be careful about the parts you want to highlight? Maybe you'd smooth over or leave out some of the parts that make them look bad. Because if you read Paul's letters, 
you get the impression that there was a lot more conflict in that early church than Acts tells us. And certainly there were different traditions and there were different beliefs and there were different worship practices in all different areas. The archaeological evidence indicates that there, were, there was a wide diversity of understandings of the faith, a, di a lot of different ways of doing Christianity, and there was a lot of disagreement about what it meant to follow in the way of Jesus right from the very beginning. And so I wonder, would that mean that they failed at the commandment to love one another? Isn't it possible that they could still love one another even through different understandings and different practices? Did they really have to be of one mind and one heart with no sense of private ownership, because I'm sure that didn't last long, to show that they were followers of the way? I don't know. I started this sermon by expressing envy over Peter's power to change people's minds. But what that story in Acts is, is about, what's really implied there is the story of Peter's willingness to have his own mind changed. That's what changed first. He could convince the others because he'd gone through it himself. Now, it's interesting with Peter because in the, I read through the book of Acts, seeing what, what Peter was doing up until this time. And he was, a, again, a powerful uh, agent of change. He, he brought a lot of people to the faith. He baptized a lot of people. But he was also very confrontational. He was a lot about repent, repent, and follow. And in some ways, he acts as a gatekeeper and a judge about what is appropriate among the followers. I don't know if you know the story of Ananias and Sapphira. So in that community pot, Ananias and Sapphira sold some property and they held back a little bit of the proceeds for themselves. And Peter confronts them and he's really angry and he says how Satan has entered into their hearts and both of them keel over dead. And after that, everyone was terrified and I'm sure it handed their property over very quickly. So I don't think Jesus had in mind that communal property by fear induced inducement. Um, but, but, but again, Peter is sort of this judge who you, in another story, uh, there's, a, there's a man who is just captivated by the message of Jesus, Jesus' way, and he, and he follows the disciples, and he gets baptized, and then he says, I, I want that power to be able to, to bring the Holy Spirit to someone. Can I give you money for that? And Peter is outraged and incensed in his eye. In his eyes, this man has sullied God by, by bringing money into the equation, and he curses the man, you know, and says he's not really of God. So Peter can be a little judgy. But then he has this vision. And in this vision, he refuses to do what God is asking him to do because of his religious beliefs, his long-held religious beliefs. Three times Peter said it happened. Three times the voice said, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, oh no, that's unclean. Think of the hubris. Peter presumes to tell God what is unclean. But Peter catches himself up. He realizes what he has done. He is trying to stand in God's way. He catches himself and he's humbled. And in that humble place, he is ready for the nudge from the Holy Spirit to go with these Gentiles who arrive looking for him. So I gotta take to heart the power to change other people's minds means that you have to be willing yourself to let go of long-held, deeply ingrained beliefs and practices. And of course, I have to wonder if this is one of the ways of loving, right? That simple command that Jesus gives, love one another. Boy, there's really a lot to it, right? Some simple words with some complex concepts. But maybe this is one way of loving one another in a Christ-like way, to be truly open, to truly listen to each other, to, to hold our own rules loosely enough, to see that they might be getting in God's way. When we think of faith as being mainly about having the right belief, we can get really 
entrenched in our beliefs. Because of course we want to believe the right thing, right? We believe ourselves to be good Christians, love God, love Jesus, want to follow Jesus. So we've got to get it right in our beliefs. We can get really stuck, closed to listening to others, to considering new perspectives. Because what if they're wrong? But I believe that Jesus was saying he didn't want our faith to be about having right belief, but about having right relationships loving relationships with God, with one another, within ourselves, with creation. Right relationships over right belief. And I think one of the messages of this passage from Acts is that right relationship means an expanding relationship, a widening relationship, opening up our ideas about who is one of us, opening up in our respect, growing in our respect for people who might practice or understand Christianity differently than we do. Expanding our compassion for people who will not, who do not act in loving ways. Don't shut down around them. Open. Right relationship is about openness. I have these few ideas and some others about what it means to live in the right relationship, in loving ways, in the ways that Jesus taught. But I am so far from being able to live these ideas out with any consistency. But I know I have to keep trying. I cannot just settle and say, ah, oh, it's good enough. Jesus loves me anyway. Jesus does love me anyway. But so much else is riding on my efforts, our efforts. This, Jesus said, is how the world will come to know the love of Jesus, him and his way, by how we live out his love, with each other first, and then with the world. This is the litmus test of our faith, of our faith. How loving are we? How loving are we to each other? Is it possible that we actually keep the world from knowing him? is good news by the ways we act toward each other. We police each other in faith. We criticize each other about beliefs or practices. We dismiss, we even demonize each other over our faith. I know it took me a long time to become a believer in the way of Christ because I thought about how Christians treated each other. Now, it was distorted because I relied on, on the newspapers and the televisions for, for an example of what Christianity was. And, and what came across to me was judgment and uh, damnation and um, all kinds of negative things. And I thought, I don't, I don't want to be part of that. That's terrible. It took, I had to get past that. And I, and I, you know, I felt like I was called by God to do that. And God certainly could work better than the media, but, but there's still, we, there's ways we can stand in God's way, in, in God's way, if we, if we can't respectfully disagree with someone, if we can't fight or resist um, negative forces rather than people, right, if we're always demonizing the person who holds an idea or a belief, we're adding to the barrier of people knowing Christ's love. And that doesn't mean we go, yeah, you know, I don't agree with you, but it's just fine for you to judge other people. Right, we wanted to resist the judgment, not the others who are doing the judging. Do you know what I'm saying? Resist the principles that are blocks to God's work in the world, not the people. Never be against the people. We are called to love the people. Now, I remember reading about the, the Westboro Baptist Church who would protest at funeral, military funerals, and really ugly behavior. I've seen some ugly behavior by Christians. But I can't criticize those people, but I do need to stand against the way they're doing things and say, I don't think that's right. I'm not going to say you're condemned to hell for doing it, but I am good because that's just joining you in that negativity, in that um, hateful, ugly action. But I can say, these people you're protesting are beloved, 
right? It can stand with people in love and truth and in that way resist the ugliness. I don't believe we have to share our property communally to be models of faith. I don't think we have to be of one mind, agreeing on everything. I don't think we even have to agree on all that much at all. We don't need to conform to one style of worship or one way of serving the world. But I do believe we need to be of one heart to be Christians. We need to be of the heart of Jesus, that merciful, loving, self-giving, ever-expanding heart of Jesus. And so we have to ask, how can we love one another right here at First Congregational Church, right now in this moment? How can we love one another and enter into the kind of glory Jesus is talking about, the glory of God? May we continue to find out together. Amen.